Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You guys just need to stretch your knees. My name is Carrington Matthews, Sr. Attorney Teresa Mafood and Attorney Carrington Matthews, Jr. We have the pleasure and the honor of representing Mr. Marquavius Huey in these proceedings. Who is Marquavius Huey? Marquavius Huey is 27 years old. He is 27 years old. He was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Born and raised in Jonesboro South housing projects, as you, as you have heard about over these last several hours throughout these various opening statements. He has six other brothers and sisters, and he actually graduated, ladies and gentlemen, from South Atlanta High School in 2014. He has two children. He has a four-year-old son, Major, and a one-year-old daughter, Journey. Mr. Marquavius Huey is not a convicted felon. He can sit on a jury. He can own a firearm. He can vote. And he can do what other law-abiding citizens can do as a non-convicted felon. He has goals, ladies and gentlemen. He has goals of being able to one day uh, open a store, a retail store that sells men's and women's clothing. It's one of his goals. And when he grew up in Jonesboro South, ladies and gentlemen, he grew up with various folks that live in that community. As any community that you live in, you gain friendships and you grow up together. And Mr. Huey, he grew up. He grew up with Jeffrey Williams. They were friends from childhood. That's what the evidence will show. You will learn that. Now, let's get into the Overt Act 76. This is a theft by receiving of a handgun in 2018. That's one of the overt acts in this case, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in that particular indictment in back in 2018, that actual indictment was brought by the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. They brought it in 2018 against Mr. Hewitt. Also in 2018, they reduced it to misdemeanor disorderly conduct. They gave him 12 months probation, and they agreed to that reduction. This table, this organization, this agency, in 2018. Now, in 2018, they reached that agreement with Mr. Huey. Now here we are in 2022 when the case, this case was indicted, and now in 23 when it's being heard, they're using the same charge that they initially charged him with, a theft by receiving of a handgun, they reduce it down to a little misdemeanor, disorderly conduct. And now they say, hey, let's tell 
the ladies and gentlemen of this RICO trial that this is an overt act in a RICO conspiracy in a YSL case. That's what they have brought to you in this indictment. The evidence will show that in 2018, this had nothing to do with anything concerning RICO. Because the evidence will show, had it, now keep in mind, the dates, 2013 to even the present, is what the government just told you all yesterday, was this RICO conspiracy. So in 2018, ladies and gentlemen, if this particular overt act has anything to do with a RICO conspiracy today, why did the same agency decide in 2018 that a felony theft by receiving charge negotiated, agreed to, should get reduced down to disorderly conduct? But this is what the evidence will show. You will learn it. And this is what's been handed to you. Now, let's break it down, this indictment. Counts three through seven we're going to go through first, and then we're going to go through another grouping of counts. But these are, there, there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of charges in this indictment with respect to Mr. Huey. There are a lot of charges, right? But when these charges are put together the way that they are supposed to be, you will see as we get through this case that there are two cases that we're dealing with in these groupings, and then we're going to talk about another incident concerning the Fulton County Jail. So just stay with me. We're going to get there. Let's first talk about April 26, 2019. These are counts three through seven. Count three, Overt Act 88, Mr. Huey is charged with armed robbery. They're saying that on April 26, they're alleging that Mr. Huey, as a party to a crime, committed this armed robbery uh, against this gentleman by the name of Dewan Maynard. That's what that particular count talks about an armed robbery using a firearm with an unknown person to take these items from this person. We're going to get into details, but I'm going to go over the charges first. Count four. They are charging Mr. Huey with over Act 89, aggravated assault, saying that with that same firearm, that Mr. Huey pointed the weapon at Mr. Maynard as he took the items, and that this makes up an aggravated assault. That's the charge. Going over the charges, then we're going to get into what the evidence is going to show. That's count four. Count five, the same one case we're talking about, the same one grouping, aggravated assault, because there was this other individual by the name of Damon Jenkins who is, was with Mr. Maynard. So they have charged Mr. Huey with this ag assault on the Damon Jenkins. Same grouping, same incident, April 26, 2019. And then count six are these tag along charges that you typically come when you get charged with an armed robbery, you're going to get an ag assault, you're going to get a possession of a firearm during a commission felony. That's how the government, that's how they indict cases. Those are the charges. We'll get into all that later, but these are the charges. We'll get into that at a different stage in this trial. But that's count six saying that Mr. Huey had in his possession this firearm when, these, when this alleged incident happened where they are claiming that Mr. Huey was involved. We're going to get into it. And then seven is that same gun charge against Mr. Damon Jenkins. 
So that's three through seven, ladies and gentlemen. April 26, 2019. So what happened? Let's get into it a little bit. April 26, 2019, around 1239 a.m. in the morning at 741 Morosco Drive, Northeast, Atlanta, Georgia, at this apartment complex called Core Lindbergh Apartments. That's a stock photo of that particular complex. Now, here's the story. The story is that, and, 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 and we're not disputing that this incident happened, we're disputing that Mr. Huey is ever a part of it. Mr. Huey stands before here, he signed an indictment and indicated that he is not guilty and he is innocent of these charges. And we stand here straight and we look you in the eye and we stand tall that Mr. Marquez Huey is innocent. So, April 26, 2019, you've got three individuals. They have left the apartment unit, and these three individuals are walking in the parking deck, right? They're walking to their car. Three individuals. As they're walking, to the car, these three individuals, they see two black males get out of a vehicle they describe as a black Mustang with a temporary tag. So these three individuals, they're in the parking deck, they're walking to their car, and two other individuals get out of the car, and they begin to chase these three individuals. There's video surveillance in the parking garage. You will likely see this video surveillance. It's the government's case, and they get to present their case however they choose. If they choose to show you a video, you will see it. Right? Now, Let's talk about these three individuals that are walking from their apartment to their car. Damon Jenkins, he lives there. He knows the apartment complex. He knows the parking deck, right? So he lives there, he's familiar with his spot. He's familiar with his crib, right? So he, he runs down the parking deck. So he's, he sees them, he's walking, he sees them, he goes down. So he goes essentially left, okay? And that's Jamon Jenkins, the apartment lessee, the owner of the apartment, his, his crib. Dewan Maynard. Dewan Maynard is with <coughs> Jamon Jenkins, right? What does he do? So he's visiting his friend, Damon Jenkins. Damon Jenkins has the keys to Maynard's vehicle. Maynard is the one with the jewelry and the items, right? Maynard, he goes right, and he goes up the parking deck, right? And he's running. Now, you've got this armed robbery that is occurring. You've got Demond Jenkins going left, down the deck. You've got Maynard going right, up the deck. Now, pay close attention. The two perpetrators, they decide that they are going to go after one person. 
not two. Right? This is an armed robbery. Right? You've got two perpetrators, you've got three victims. One of those victims goes left. Jenkins, Maynard goes right. Maynard is the one is the one person out of those three that those two perpetrators go after. So you've got two individuals that are the perpetrators chasing Maynard up the parking deck. The third male, I guess he goes down and he is not chased. He goes down, one goes left, he ducks. The other one, go, Maynard goes up the deck. The two perpetrators chase Maynard. That's the story, that's how it's happened. <coughs> now, the two perpetrators, they reach Maynard. When they reach Maynard, ladies and gentlemen, Maynard, he says when he got hit with, one of them hit him with a firearm, and that they took items. Now these are the items that Maynard says were taken. This is what he says were taken. He says a ring, a diamond five point star ring. He says two gold chain necklaces, one with a cross, another with diamonds, one pair of diamond earrings, a gold Gucci bracelet, a SunTrust debit card, a Gucci bag, a Louis Vuitton bag, and some cash. So you got all this grouping of items that Maynard says that was taken from him. You've got police officers galore that come over to the scene, right? So you've got responding officers, you've got white shirt officers, you've got sergeants, everybody responding there trying to figure out what happened. They talked to Maynard and Jenkins, right? They talked to the security guard, Joel Hines. Joel Hines, he says that, uh, you know, I was patrolling the area. I saw this black vehicle that had been parked and running for about an hour or so. Uh, it had tinted windows, and I couldn't see inside. And, you know, uh, apartment owners, sometimes they'll come sit in their apartment in their cars before they go inside. So I didn't think anything of it. I didn't see anybody. I didn't get a look at anyone. So the security guard, he doesn't see any individuals that are in the uh, black vehicle. They canvass the parking deck. The officers, they get surveillance videos from the parking garage. So that's, their, that's what the officers are doing. That's what, that's what they did that night, right? Now, <clears throat> here's where it gets interesting, ladies and gentlemen. On April 26, 2019, <clears throat> at 12.39 in the morning, that's when this event, that's when this incident happened. Demond Jenkins, when he goes left, you got a, Demond Jenkins, who's the apartment owner, when he goes left, he goes downstairs, he runs out, and he happens to see an officer, he flags him down. So that officer's right there, pretty much. All right? And then the uh, and then other officers start coming and converging on this incident scene to try to figure out what happened. But on that same day, later that day, later that day, later that day, Maynard, the one whose items he claims were taken, he does this, I don't know if he does an internet search, <clears throat> what he does. How in the world of millions of social media people that are on social media, Instagrammers, people that have pages, Maynard calls into zone two and he tells the police that he just happened to be scrolling Instagram and he saw a person wearing his diamond five point star ring. Imagine that, less than hours. So what does he do? Maynard calls, calls in. You will hear evidence that when he calls in, that he sends some photographs. I'm going to get to that. So the case is assigned to Detective Jeffrey Henderson on April 28, 2019. 
So the case now has a detective. A couple days later. Detective Jeffrey Henderson now has this case. What does he do when he gets the case? Well, he gets Maynard to send him these photographs. He views the video surveillance footage that was that he obtained from the parking deck, from the apartment complex. And he asked him to send some pictures of the jewelry. So send this information that you found on Instagram, send me some pictures of your jewelry, and send me some videos, and, and let me take a look at the video surveillances that I was able to get from the parking deck. So these are the photographs that Maynard, the victim in the case, he sends Detective Jeffrey Henderson two separate Instagram pictures of two separate people. On the left there is a picture he sends of someone else, some person in the world on social media. Maynard sends that photograph and he sends the one on the right. The one on the right is Mr. Huey's Instagram. The one on the left is someone else's Instagram. He sends these to me, to, to the to Detective Henderson. Two different people with the same ring, or the similar ring, or some ring that looks like the one that he owned the same day. So he becomes his own detective. Now, the video that was obtained from the parking garage, ladies and gentlemen, that video, it shows the two perpetrators running after Maynard, right? One of those perpetrators has on like a, a black, black jacket and maybe some red, uh, pants or something of that nature. The other person has on a gold puff jacket and some black slacks, pants or jeans or whatever. So that's what, that's what the video is showing from the parking garage. So <clears throat> what does Detective Henderson do? So he goes on to Mr. Huey's page, and I guess start scrolling Mr. Huey's page. Oh, Mr. Huey has a gold puff jacket. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? In this particular, Mr. Huey's is on the right, standing in front of a black infinity vehicle that belongs to his lady, Justice Woodard, who is the mother of their, of their two children. Major in journey. On the left is a photograph. You heard Mr. App talk about that huge discovery that was sent to us. The evidence will show that that particular photograph is part of the discovery that came to us in this pile of evidence that is a part of this case. That on the left are two young men. And what's interesting here, ladies and gentlemen, is that apparently that year, the gold pump jacket from Zara was a, was a very popular item for young people as part of their wardrobe. We know that because you're going to learn that this is what was sent to us and that is what was going on with the dress back in 2019. Three different people with the same gold pump jacket that was provided to us in Discover. That the government provided to us. 
So the gold pub jacket is relevant here. Why? Because what was Detective Jeffrey Henderson's investigation at that point? Maynard sends him these two hands with the similar jewelry. Maynard sends him a piece of jewelry of his own to say, hey, you know, this is, this is what was one of the items that was taken from me. And the video, the video, ladies and gentlemen, from the apartment complex shows a person with that similar gold puff jacket. And what does Detective Jeffrey, Jeffrey Henderson do with that information, ladies and gentlemen? He completes it. He completes his investigation. This happened on April 26, 2019. Four days later, he gets a warrant <coughs> for Mr. Hughes' arrest on that investigation. That is the case. Now, there is no photographic lineup that was ever done. Maynard never says he saw Mr. Huey that night on April 26, 2019. They're not wearing masks. Mr. Devon Jenkins never selects Mr. Huey out of any photographic lineup. In fact, there was none done. There was no photographic lineup performed or attempted to be performed by Detective Henderson for the benefit of Maynard or the benefit of Jenkins in this case. He took what he got from that video surveillance, went on to receive the information that Maynard sent him and decided that there was enough for a warrant. No photographic identification, no fingerprints left at any of those scenes, no shell casings that are linked to any firearms belonging to Mr. Healy. None of it. That's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn, ladies and gentlemen, that at any arrest that was made against Mr. Huey, any arrest that was made against Mr. Huey with respect to these items that Mr. Maynard says were taken from him, a gold five-star five ring, uh, these necklaces, these items that we're talking about here, the Gucci, the Louis Vuitton, the, the debit cards, None of those items have ever been found on Mr. Huey's person, on Mr. Huey's in car, in any residence. None. That's the state's case for those grouping of charges, ladies and gentlemen. No DNA. Detective Henderson didn't even, when, when they arrested Mr. Huey for those particular charges, those groupings of charges, he didn't come down to the jail and, and even pull him out of the cell and say, hey, I want to talk with you. Are you willing to talk with me? Of course, that's Mr. Huey's right to either talk to him or not talk to him, but he didn't even try. No other witnesses out there at that location that are going to tell you that they ever saw Mr. Huey at that location. That's what you're going to learn about that grouping of cases. No photographic lineup. Ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is interesting. Listen to me very closely. You will not hear any evidence of a cell phone 
tower locating Mr. Huey at 741 Morosco Drive, Northeast Atlanta, Georgia. You will not hear it. In the technology driven world that we live in, cell phone evidence is powerful in terms of being able to put people at locations. Ask me, did Detective Henderson make any efforts to do that? <clears throat> you will learn the answer is no. Okay, that was that grouping of cases, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. That was that case from April 26, 2019. Okay. Now let's move on to this other grouping of cases that we just, uh, that I want to talk about now. So let's move on to another time and another place. Let's go to October 1st, 2020. Now, count 14, when you all get this indictment, count 14 over Act 116 charges Mr. Huey with armed robbery, alleging that Mr. Huey and another unknown person committed an armed robbery against a gentleman by the name of Gary Holloman. That's what count 14 says, by use of a firearm. That's 14. 15, we're still on October 1, 2020. These next series of counts are going to deal with one day. This particular count, 15, our robbery says that on that same evening that Mr. Huey, along with this unknown person, committed this armed robbery against Domitia Coppage, who was supposed to be, who was out there with Gary Holloman at an address that we're going to get to in just a moment. But I want to go over the, the charges first, and we're going to get into the facts in a moment. So that's the charge right there. Count 15, an armed robbery concerning Domitia Coppage. Count 16, this is a big case, ladies and gentlemen, so give me an opportunity to try to organize it as best you can. Because we definitely have been learning all year how to organize a big case. Count 16, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Like I said, whenever there's this armed robbery uh, allegation, it's going to come with a host of other counts and charges tagging along with it. Because that's the way the state and government, that's how they do it. That's how they get down and that's how they do it. That's their right and that's how they want to bring it. But we're going to talk about it. Count 16 alleges aggravated assault. So whenever you commit an armed robbery, then you've got a firearm, then you're going to get an aggravated assault charge with it. That's the aggravated account charge that deals with Gary Holloman. That's 16. 17 deals with Demisha Coppage. <coughs> 18 is another way of alleging an armed robber. When you specifically use a firearm to take this clicker out of my hand, that's armed robbery. But if this clicker were an automobile, and I was sitting in this automobile, and you use a weapon to demand me to get out of the automobile, it's an armed robbery, but they call it, it's a separate charge that's called hijacking of a motor vehicle. Basically, it's an armed robbery of a car, or an auto, a truck, or a vehicle. That's count 18. They're saying that Mr. Huey 
along with this other person, took a 2016 Buick LaCrosse from Gary Holland. That's 18. 19, again, whenever there's a weapon that's involved, they're going to tag along this possession of a firearm to the commission of, in this case, the ag assault with a deadly weapon and the hijacking of a motor vehicle. So you're going to get a possession of a firearm during a commission of a felony charge. Same thing with respect to Ms. Coppedge. Armed robbery and an aggravated assault to take that cell phone that there's, she's saying was taken. You're going to get a count 20, a possession of a firearm during a commission of a felony. And then what they've done is they've said in 21 that this was gang related. So they tack on a gang, a criminal street gang charge. And the same thing for Ms. Coppage. So those are the street gang charges that they've alleged. That's 23. So let's get into it now. So those are the charges, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> On October 1, 2020, 250 Fulton Street, Southwest Atlanta, Georgia. Not very far from where we are now. Over by the juvenile court building. They're alleging that on this particular October 1, 2020, in the evening hours, that, and that these charges that we just talked about occurred. Now let's deal with it. What is being alleged here? <clears throat> Gary Holloman, who's no longer with us, ladies and gentlemen, Gary Holloman sold pills for a living. He was a drug dealer. And Mr. Huey had gotten injured. And his injury was the result of a, of a shot to his leg and being out in the public and living in the area, there was a shooting incident. He got shot. Okay. When he got shot, he ran out of the ability to get medicine, the right one. So what did he do? He found that this guy, Holloman, that he knew through this other person, Mender, that Mr. Holloman sold Percocets. So what happens? He had been dealing with Mr. Holloman for some period of time. You're going to hear about it. And how, you, how do you know you're going to hear about it? Because when Detective Henderson comes into this courtroom and sits in this witness stand, I'm going to ask him questions about it. Now, Huey knows Gary Holloman because they have been doing business. Mr. Holloman purchased two or three pills periodically, $20 a pop, Percocets. And he dealt with Holloman various occasions. Nothing unusual. I'm going to meet, I'm going to meet you. Uh, I'm going to call you, right? He calls him. Huey calls Holloman from time to time, right? And when he calls Holloman from time to time, Holloman, in fact, you will learn through Henderson that Henderson, when they arrested Mr. Huey on these charges, they sit Mr. Huey down 
in an interview room. And when they sent Mr. Ho Mr. Huey down in an interview room, Henderson reads him his rights. And Mr. Huey agrees to talk with him without an attorney. He's not have anything to hide. I'm okay talking to you without a lawyer. He sits down, talks to him. And Mr. Huey, he didn't, he didn't know specifically why he was even being arrested at that moment. And you'll, you'll hear about it, right? And when you hear about it, Henderson is saying, hey, somebody's saying that you carjacked him. Okay, tell me about it. What, what are you talking about? And then Huey and Detective Henderson, Huey says, okay, so you're talking about the streets have been talking. The streets have been talking. They saying that I set Holloman up. They saying I set Holloman up. I didn't set Holloman up. I deal with Holloman. I set this man up. Holloman chose this particular location for us to meet and we've met before. I know this man. In fact, now here's where it gets real interesting. In fact, Huey says to Holloman, I mean to, to Henderson, Detective Henderson, you can look through my phone. So, Henderson looks through the phone. And what does he see, ladies and gentlemen? He sees a... We're going to object to this portion of self-serving hearsay. Yep, the evidence will, will show. I will rule the objection. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that Henderson, they have the phone out. Huey is leaning over. Henderson has the phone. They're scrolling. Okay. 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 But the warrants had already been written up. He was in jail. He was arrested that night. He was being arrested for it on the 24th of November, 2020. <clears throat> but Mr. Huey shows Mr. Henderson that he and Holloman had a relationship. You got something I want? I'm, you got something that, that I want to get? Some Percocets? They're available. That's, that was our relationship, right? Now, that's what Huey says to Henderson and is corroborated in a phone that belonged to Mr. Huey that Henderson was allowed to look at on that particular morning when they arrested this man. So that's what came out from Mr. Huey. Let's talk about what came out from Mr. Holland when he called 911. So what does Holloman basically say in the 911 call? He says that I just got robbed and he says my nephew homeboy robbed me. My nephew's homeboy robbed me. That's what he says. And I was meeting with him because my nephew wanted me to give him some money to put on my nephew's books at the Fulton County Jail. That's what Holloman says to 911. Now, you're going to ask yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is going to show that you don't need to give money to your nephew's homeboy to put on your nephew's books at the Fulton County Jail. The evidence will show there are many ways in which you can put money on somebody's books at the Fulton County Jail instead of giving money 
to your nephew homeboy. So, you are going to have to reconcile that story that my man Holloman told 911. And in the 911 call, he didn't say, that's what he said, my nephew's homeboys, I'm putting some money, giving money to Mr. Giving some money to my nephew homeboy. That's what he said. So you're going to reconcile those. You're going to have to balance those two versions of events. You're going to have to ask yourself, and here's the other thing you're going to learn with that same, with this same case. You're going to learn that Mr. Holloman tells Mr. Henderson that Mr. Huey didn't have a firearm. And he's going to say, whatever he's going to say from my understanding is somebody just walked up out of, out of, out of, out of the dock and put a stick on him and took his car. Not Mr. Huey. What does Delmisha Coppage? Delmisha Coppage you're going to learn that she actually lived at 250 Fulton Street, right? And that Mr. Holloman was there to meet her, right? And you're going to learn from Domitia Coppage if they decide to call her as a witness that they interviewed Domitia Coppage in September of 2022, shortly after they indicted this case that we're here today on, they decided to go out and, you know, do their field interviews of their alleged victims and talk to them. In September of 2022, Domitia Coppage tells Officer Investigator Viverito, she tells this law enforcement person that yeah, they took BG's car, Gary Holloman, BG. They took BG's car, and they also took my car. So the other one left in my car. You will hear that. And there had been no information, allegations of her car ever being taken on October 1, 2020, until... September 22nd, 2022, when she told it to investigator Viverito. Mr. Hughes is not even charged with taking Delmisha Coppage's vehicle. Why would she say something like that? So you all, as the triers of fact, fancy little phrase that we use in the legal business, you all, as the decider, will have to determine with whom you will believe. What is the credibility? So those are things and decisions that you will have to make. But her car was never, ever taken. These are the items that were claimed that had been taken. A Buick LaCrosse. Gary Holloman's cell phone, Domitia Cobbage's cell phone, and Mr. Holloman tells, tells him, $10,000 in cash. You will be assessing the credibility of witnesses throughout this case. For each of these wrongfully accused individuals that are seated at these tables, now, witnesses are going to come into this courtroom, and they're going to sit right here. And you'll see me. You may see Attorney CJ. You may see some of these other lawyers. We're going to be standing right here, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going to be asking them questions on the witness stand. And they have come into this court and raised their hand, promising to tell them God's honest truth. 
And when we get them into this courtroom, and when we cross-examine them, and we bring it out and establish certain things, we're going to come back to you, and we're going to tell you why, when we set this in opening, that this is the way it should go. Let's change gears. One last gear, a few last gears to change. I know, we're, I know it's a long day, we're getting there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's move to a different day and time. So that was that case. So we have covered counts three through seven for an April 26, 2019 situation. We have covered, and by the way, before I get into this, let me back up one more step. <clears throat> No vehicle cross was ever found in Mr. Huey's possession. No cell phone was ever found in Mr. Huey's possession belonging to Demisha Coffage, Gary Oliver. And in fact, there's technology out here, ladies and gentlemen, where these smartphones, these iPhones, you know, they stay on, right? You can track these bad boys. You're going to ask, we're going to be asking questions down the line. So when I'm up standing and cross-examining and talking to these witnesses, pay very close attention to, you know, that technology, these smartphones. What did they, what did Detective Henderson do to follow up? Mr. Matthews, I hate to interrupt your, uh, your opening remarks. Um, can we take a... A brief comfort break. How much longer do you have, sir? Probably 30 minutes. All right, let's take a comfort break, okay? All right, 10 minutes, ladies and gentlemen.